ABC News Live. NBA star Kyrie Irving faces new fallout after tweeting about a book and film featuring anti-Semitic tropes and once again not apologizing when asked on camera about it. NBA Commissioner Adam Silver is now set to speak with Irving as calls grow for the athlete to face disciplinary action. The controversy comes as cases of anti-Semitism rise across the country, now leading the FBI to issue a warning about threats to New Jersey synagogues. Protective glass and panic buttons. More security measures are being taken at election offices as authorities warn of increased threats against election workers. Meanwhile, the future of who controls Congress hangs in the balance. What new poll numbers reveal about who's taking the lead in some of the country's most pivotal races. And in the home stretch in the race to November, we speak to the man who once held the title the fastest member in Congress, Republican Senator John Thune. The Senate Minority Whip is hoping to sprint to his fourth term and use his platform to steer his party in what he believes is the best direction. I want our party to be a party that appeals to people's hopes, not preys on their fears. And I think there's a lot of division in the country today. People are scared, there's a lot of fear. Terrifying moments for a woman who was attacked and raped while jogging in New York City early this morning. Investigators have now linked the suspect to at least two other attacks. More rising tensions overseas after North Korea fired off a new round of missiles, this time aiming them toward Japan. North Korea has launched about 30 missiles in just two days, the joint warning from the U.S. and South Korea. Getting out the vote on college campuses. Now that athletes have the freedom to use their name, image, and likeness off the playing field, some are helping to push their peers to the polls. Standing up for heroes. Our own Bob Woodruff is teaming up with comedian Jeff Ross to tell us about an annual event that honors our nation's veterans with a night of hope, healing, and jokes. Do you want to give us a little taste of how you would roast our very own Bob Woodruff? Perhaps? Oh, my goodness. Well, let's start with why he's dressed like a used car salesman. <laughs> no, Bob Woodruff is always so debonair. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. The countdown clock now registers just five days until the midterm elections, with candidates making their closing arguments and the control of Congress at stake. President Biden is visiting New Mexico and California today after urging Americans in a speech last night to stand up against, quote, extreme MAGA Republicans, focusing on what he called an ongoing threat against democracy. The president tied the attack of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband to the political violence at the Capitol on January 6th, citing the same question the suspect allegedly asked, where's Nancy? Tonight, we are learning new details about that suspect, David DePap, including reports he had been in the country illegally for years. At the same time, 82-year-old Paul Pelosi has been released from the hospital after undergoing surgery for his injuries. It's an assault that underscores the nation's deep political divisions, just as Americans are set to exercise their power at the ballot box. Once again, ABC's Mola Lange is in San Francisco and leads us off. Tonight, there are multiple reports that the man charged in the brutal attack on House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband, Paul, inside their home was in the U.S. for years illegally. U.S. authorities say they have a record of David DePap, a Canadian citizen, entering the country legally in 2008 at the U.S.-Mexico border. What's unclear is if authorities have any other records of DePap entering or leaving the U.S. through either Canada or Mexico since then. Visitors from Canada are generally allowed to stay here in the country for up to six months at a time. DePap now being held without bail, facing state and federal charges in the attack on Paul Pelosi early Friday morning in San Francisco. We certainly view him as a public safety risk to the city of San Francisco, certainly to uh, the speaker as, as time goes forward. According to the federal affidavit, DePap allegedly telling police that he had planned to hold Nancy hostage, saying if she lied, he was going to break her kneecaps. Paul Pelosi calling 911. DePap striking Pelosi in the head with a hammer just after police arrived. According to the San Francisco DA's office, after the attack, DePap allegedly saying, I didn't really want to hurt him, but you know, this was a suicide mission. I'm not going to stand here and do nothing, even if it cost me my life. And naming other targets, including a professor and several prominent state and federal politicians and their relatives. And tonight, new questions after sources tell ABC News that Capitol Police only saw the break-in after they noticed the flashing lights from San Francisco police in the home surveillance video and rewound the footage. Also tonight, we're learning that Paul Pelosi is out of the hospital and back at home 
recovering from his injuries. Good to know he's back at home. Mola Lange joins us now. Mola, I know you just got a new statement from the Pelosi family a few moments ago. What does it say? Well, that's right. Paul Pelosi released from the hospital less than a week after that attack. In that statement released by the Speaker's office, the family thanked the 911 operator, medical staff, among others, adding Paul remains under doctor's care as he continues to progress on a long recovery process and convalescence. Also, that he is now home, surrounded by his family, who request privacy, Lindsay. Mola Lange, our thanks to you. And just days away from Election Day, there's growing concern about threats directed at election workers. This comes as President Biden warned in his speech last night that the issue of election safety and the idea of preserving democracy is on the ballot. So tonight, ABC's Terry Moran reports with the poll workers who are facing unprecedented challenges while assuring voters their ballots are secure. These are the images haunting the midterms. Armed poll watchers in tactical gear and balaclavas monitoring ballot boxes in Arizona raising the specter of conflict and violence in the election. In Adams County, Colorado today, election workers received a ballot with a suspicious powdery substance. We identified it uh, through our processes, secured the ballot, and contacted law enforcement. Authorities are now testing that substance. All right, so this is headquarters. Across the country, election workers like Adams County Clerk Josh Ziegelbaum are doing everything in their power to keep the vote safe, secure, and true. He shows us some of the extraordinary new measures he's um, taken. Voters used to be able to enter in through glass double doors, which have now been replaced with solid core wood doors on badge access. These do have garage doors. And um, there's panic buttons? There's panic buttons Each underneath. Part. Ziegelbaum, a former Marine and father of five, has been personally targeted by so many threats that on the advice of the sheriff, he alters his commute every day and wears a bulletproof vest. You wearing one now? Yes, yeah, I wear one pretty much every single day. You come to work with a bulletproof vest? Yes. In state after state, threats and intimidation against election workers have taken a stunning toll. 10 of Nevada's 17 counties have seen their top election official leave. In Pennsylvania, county election directors or assistant directors in more than 50 of the state's 67 counties have left. And in Texas, 30% of all election officials are gone. Yeah. In Adams County, the work continues. And we're following three election workers who are going around and collecting ballots from the drop boxes. And they're being accompanied by a sheriff's deputy. Sign of the times. We just watch each other's back. Watch each I'm... other's back because you're concerned about security. Safety. safety. Yeah. yeah. Personal safety. Oh, yeah. yeah. Exactly. President Biden pleading with Americans in a way no president has had to do in generations. There's no place, no place for voter intimidation or political violence in America, whether it's directed at Democrats or Republicans. No place, period. No place ever. Today, Michigan's Secretary of State says the election there will be protected. Election officials and law enforcement are more prepared than ever before to immediately address any attempt to interfere or disrupt the election's process or intimidate voters. And in Philadelphia, the district attorney with a stark warning. Extremists of any type who are pondering, interfering in any way with a free, fair, and final election better be warned. We have handcuffs, we have jail cells, and we have Philadelphia juries that will be here. They sound like they are prepared. Terry Moran joins us now. Terry, we're seeing this concern, though, from election officials. Is there confidence that the vote will be safe and secure? Absolutely, Lindsay. There's no question that election workers who are our neighbors, our local election officials, uh, are doing their jobs. They're doing their best. And what they say is that uh, the processes around the security of the elections have improved. You'll remember in 2020, when then-President Trump ordered the Attorney General Bill Barr to send the Department of Justice out and go find voter fraud and election fraud, Barr came back and said there isn't any of any significance. And this year, in the more than 175,000 places in America where Americans will vote, election workers are saying that will hold true again. Lindsay? All right, that's comforting news there. Terry Moran, our thanks to you. 
For more on the final sprint to Election Day, I want to welcome in ABC News political director, Mr. Rick Klein. Great to have you back, as always, Rick. So you and I were here yesterday as President Biden was giving his closing argument, basically, about the threat to democracy. Is that risky, do you think, considering that so top of mind for many voters is, is uh, inflation and crime? From the White House perspective, it's a risk worth taking. They recognize that people are much more focused on inflation, most more focused on uh, the sa public safety, even issues like education and health care. But from their point of view, Americans aren't focused enough on the risk to democracy and that uh, they don't want to wake up on next Wednesday morning and, and recognize that they left something on the table in terms of what the final argument has been. I think they recognize also that it's very difficult to get voters to change their minds this late in the election cycle uh, to get people to refocus on these threats of democracy when they're, they're really, frankly, they're so hard to even get your arms around. But they, 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 they will not apologize for underscoring the stakes of this moment and trying to highlight what they view as, uh, as extremists who would be a true threat. And when you talk about the stakes of this moment, obviously there's been so much focus yeah. on the control of the Senate and that hanging in the balance. And so let's start with Pennsylvania and Georgia. 538 has those two states deadlocked. Uh, we'll begin in Georgia with the battle between Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock. Yeah, this has been an interesting one because we had late, late revelations uh, just, just this, this past week with the uh, second accuser that, that said that, he, that Herschel Walker paid for her to, to obtain an abortion. As you know, Lindsay, you've reported extensively on this and interviewed uh, Herschel Walker about it. Uh, the question of how much that matters is, is a real one. As of today, I think it's likely um, that it, 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 this is going to head to a runoff and we're going to be into overtime in Georgia because it could be that neither candidate tops 50 percent. I also think it's al almost al almost as likely that this is the state that determines everything. This is going to be the one that we're waiting on uh, well into the night on Tuesday and then well beyond to determine control. And, and let's talk about Pennsylvania between John Fetterman and Dr. Mehmet Oz. Where are things there? What's fascinating is that uh, you're going to see an all-out sprint. This is going to be the, a state that's got three presidents uh, uh, in it all, all at once over the weekend. Former President Trump is a rally. So does Barack Obama and Joe Biden. Democrats now view, view Pennsylvania not just as an insurance policy. This is a potential pickup for them, but probably a necessity for them to flip that Senate seat if they're going to have any chance of holding on to the Senate. Obviously, our voting patterns have changed so much since the pandemic. What do we know so far uh, based on early votes? A lot of people are voting. Uh, there's no doubt about that. 30 million plus, well more than in previous cycles this early. What's impossible to know truly is whether this just reflects a more uh, partisan breakdown about how people vote. More Democrats are voting than Republicans. Democrats will walk into Election Day with a lead, a big lead in the vote. There's a couple of states like Florida, notably, where Democratic turnout is down. Uh, that's a bad sign for Democrats. There are a bunch of places, though, where they're doing what they need to do, and then more so Pennsylvania and, and Arizona, maybe a little bit less so. Uh, they, are, they are definitely getting their vote out. I think it's fair to say this is not a low interest or a low turnout election, Lindsay. I think we can count on a long night on Tuesday. <laughs> yes, and, day, and days and days. Rick Klein, our thanks to you. Thank you. Next Tuesday, ABC News Live is your home for midterm election coverage. We'll have live coverage on ABC News Live all morning and throughout the day. And beginning at 7 p.m. Eastern, I'll join David Muir and our powerhouse political team on ABC to bring you election results as they come in on this very critical night and perhaps the days to come, as Rick mentioned. The FBI reports that it has received credible information of a broad threat to synagogues in New Jersey. The agency is now urging synagogues to take all security precautions to protect their community and facilities. State of Officials say law enforcement will be increasing patrols in sensitive areas. Meanwhile, NBA superstar Kyrie Irving remains under fire after posting a link to an anti-Semitic film on social media. Irving and his team last night issued a joint statement and donated a million dollars to the Anti-Defamation League. But so far, the league has not disciplined him and Irving has not apologized. ABC's Trevor Alt has the latest. Tonight, embattled basketball star Kyrie Irving defending himself amid criticism of his sharing an anti-Semitic documentary. During today's practice, Irving saying he claims responsibility, but stopping short of offering a public apology. I didn't mean to cause any harm. I'm not the one that made the documentary. For the record, do you have any anti-Semitic beliefs? I cannot be anti-Semitic if I know where I come from. That documentary is rife with anti-Semitic views. Irving retweeted a link to it last week, sparking widespread condemnation, including from Brooklyn Nets owner Joe Tsai. Irving continued to defend his actions, but deleted the tweet. He and the Nets later announcing they'll each donate $500,000 to causes and organizations that work to eradicate hate and intolerance in our communities. 
Irving has promoted multiple false conspiracies in the past, and League Commissioner Adam Silver says he plans on meeting with Irving next week, adding, I am disappointed that he has not offered an unqualified apology and more specifically denounced the vile and harmful content contained in the film he chose to publicize. Trevor Altar, thanks to you. A horrifying assault in New York City. A woman was attacked and raped while on a jog along the Hudson River just before dawn this morning. The attacker took off with her clothes, credit cards, and phone, but was taken into custody within hours. Tonight, investigators believe the suspect may be linked to two other rapes. ABC Stephanie Ramos has the latest. Tonight, a suspected serial attacker is under arrest in New York City. Police say 29-year-old Carl Fanner, who is homeless, attacked a 43-year-old woman running in a park along New York's West Side Highway around 5.30 this morning, grabbing her from behind, choking, then assaulting her. Police say he stole her wallet and headphones. She was found by another jogger who called 911. She needed help. She had clearly been traumatized in some way and assaulted. She was just kind of repeating over and over again, I need help. Fanner arrested hours later, allegedly after using the victim's credit card at a target. Authorities charging him with two other attacks, one in the same park back in March and another on the east side. Our thanks to Stephanie Ramos. Overseas now, tensions remain high after North Korea fired off a new round of missiles, this time toward Japan. It's been an unprecedented barrage from Kim Jong-un, more than two dozen in just two days, causing concern and raising questions. And tonight, a joint warning from the U.S. and South Korea. Here's ABC's chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raditz. Tonight, the U.S. and South Korea warning North Korea that if it ever attacks the U.S. or its allies with a nuclear weapon, it will be the end of the Kim regime. The warning comes as North Korean missile launches are intensifying at unprecedented levels. Nearly 30 launched in less than 48 hours, including overnight an intercontinental ballistic missile aimed towards Japan. The launch prompting the wailing of emergency sirens across northern Japan with urgent warnings for citizens to seek cover. That missile did not reach Japanese airspace, instead falling into the waters west of the islands. The test launch believed to be a failure. But the barrage of short-range missiles, many pointing towards South Korea, is showing no sign of letting up. Kim Jong-un blaming joint U.S.-South Korean military drills dubbed Vigilant Storm for his missile response. Today, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin meeting with his South Korean counterpart. Our commitment to defending the ROK is ironclad. This also comes as U.S. officials say the North is preparing a nuclear test, something they have not done in five years. Martha Raddatz joins us tonight. Martha, with tension so high on the peninsula, a stern warning to North Korea, not just if it tests a nuclear weapons attack. Exactly, Lindsay. The U.S. also telling Kim Jong-un he will face additional costs, additional consequences if he conducts a nuclear test. Although at this point, U.S. officials believe he almost certainly will. Lindsay? Mm. Doesn't seem likely to stop him. Martha Raddatz, our thanks to you. When we come back, the extremists who threw a Molotov cocktail into a business because of a particular art show they were hosting. Our Bob Woodruff and legendary roaster Jeff Ross join up to talk Stand Up for Heroes. That's Bob's great event that honors veterans. It's a funny conversation you won't want to miss. But up next, he is one of the most powerful Republicans in America. Senator John Thune of South Dakota had a chance to run with a man that some say may one day replace Mitch McConnell as the leading Republican in the Senate. What he had to say about his party party coming up. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. 
Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Elizabeth Holmes found guilty on four counts of fraud, facing the possibility of decades in prison. Now, we take you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes. The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners. And the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Take a look at this video of an unidentified man firebombing a donut shop in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Police say the business, which had earlier hosted an art event run by drag queens, has been targeted in recent weeks. Fortunately, the fire damage from the Molotov cocktail was minor. The man reportedly left a note behind which contained viable verses and hateful rhetoric. We're just five days away until the midterm election, and Republicans tonight are hoping that voters will help them take back control of the Senate. If they do, all eyes will be on Mitch McConnell's top lieutenant, Senator John Thune, who one day just might become majority leader himself. On a brisk fall morning before the latest instance of political violence involving Paul Pelosi, we traveled to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where Senator Thune told us about the need for compromise and how he hopes his party will come out on top in the race to November. I'm prepared to be embarrassed. When Senator John Thune last ran the ACLI Capital Challenge, a three-mile road race, he earned the distinction of the fastest member of Congress. One of my Senate colleagues reminded me that's like, that's like being the best surfer in Kansas. <laughs> it's a nice title, but it doesn't mean much. Perhaps even more impressive, almost a half a century removed from high school, still to this day hold the record in the 800-meter 159.7. <laughs> That's well, impressive. Well, it's actually 0.57. <laughs> they got it wrong on the board. Oh, is that right? <laughs> on a rainy morning in South Dakota, the state famously known as the home of Mount Rushmore, the Senate Minority Whip, who's now seeking his fourth term, tells us his political aspirations all began with a chance encounter after a high school basketball game. Let's start in 1976 and yeah. how one missed free throw shot <laughs> really right. kind of shaped your political career. My start in politics kind of started with a basketball game on a Friday night. A congressman showed up and watched. <laughs> and then he came back. It was a tournament. We were playing again the next night. He says, I noticed you missed one last night. <laughs> and I'm like, who's this smart aleck? He introduced himself as Congressman Jim Abner. And eventually, when I got out of grad school, he offered me a job. Had it not been for that chance encounter in January of 1976, I'm quite sure I wouldn't be doing this. His early start in team sports ultimately helped prepare him to tackle perhaps the most rough and tumble sport of all, politics. There are a lot of lessons in sports, track especially, knowing how to finish. And being able, you know, to be, learn to be unselfish. If you want to be successful and you want to win, 
you got to make the people around you better. This husband, father of two, and grandfather is widely considered to be a potential successor to Republican leader Mitch McConnell. Thune says despite the growing divide in Washington, he learned his values growing up in America's heartland. I'm eternally grateful for the experience of growing up in a small town, going to small school. There's a sense of community. People look out for each other. And there's also a, an understanding you have to work hard. Others in his party haven't always rallied around his message. After calling the attack on January 6th inexcusable and disgusting, and then accepting the results of the 2020 presidential election, earlier this year, Donald Trump made Thune the focus of his ire. The former president calling him a rhino, or Republican in name only on Twitter, and suggesting Governor Kristi Noem would defeat him in a primary challenge. Noem is currently in a tighter-than-expected race for a second term as governor after calling Thune a friend. But if the polls are any indication, Thune is in no danger of losing his seat to his Democratic challenger, Brian Bangs. Still, Thune admits he had some hesitation before deciding to seek re-election. You're 61, clearly in great shape. Why did you almost not run again? You know, having my kids and grandkids here, I spend 35 to 40 weeks a year in Washington. My primary residence, obviously, is here, so home's here. But in the end, it came down to, I feel, I feel like I've got something to offer and to contribute. Greatest strength. The willingness to do things that other people maybe aren't willing to do, to go the extra mile. Sure. No pun intended. No, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Biggest weakness? The need for approval, make people happy, realizing you can't do it all the time. What role does faith play in your life? It forms a lot of those core values and uh, shapes the way I interact with people. There's a passage in the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, it says, don't let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart, and you'll fi find favor and good repute with both God and people. He's taking that scripture and running with it in the hopes of helping to steer his party in what he believes is the right direction. What concerns you most about the direction of the Republican Party right now? I want our party to be a party that appeals to people's hopes, not preys on their fears. And I think there's a lot of division in the country today. People are scared. There's a lot of fear. And um, we ought to be the party that, that raises their hopes and their aspirations. Thune says sticking to core conservative values is necessary. Initially, uh, it seemed that you supported Lindsey Graham's 15-week uh, abortion ban. Subsequently, you've said that you feel like the federal government should get out of the abortion business. Do you think that it's a matter of what happened in Kansas where this is a matter that should be put to voters? Lindsey's bill is 15 weeks. That's where 47 out of 50 countries in Europe are. That's where most of the civilized world is. At some point, there will be a consensus that comes up around, I think, this issue and probably starts at the state level, eventually, maybe at the national level. Despite the increasing number of mass shootings in this country, Thune still tries to justify providing access to the type of weapon used in many of the attacks. In my state, they use them to shoot prairie dogs and, you know, other types of varmints. You've talked before about AR-15s and how people here in South Dakota often use them to shoot prairie dogs. Now, these are animals that are normally 12 to 16 inches, 1 to 3 pounds. Is there another gun that, that could be used? My whole issue on how people use their firearms, it's their Second Amendment um, right. And if they're legal uses, if they use them to shoot targets, if they use them for home protection, uh, that's, their, that's their prerogative. That's their Second Amendment right. Despite many of his traditional Republican stances, with the need for a new farm bill next year, Thune acknowledges the potential impact of climate change on the future of his state, where agriculture is its bread and butter. Is there a conflict with those who are, are fighting against climate change and those who are fighting for farmers? Agriculture is a basic core industry in America, um, as is energy. If you're looking for a solution to uh, carbon emissions in the country, I think there's a way in which uh, agriculture can contribute to that. And I think that people who think everything's got to be electric vehicles have got to get realistic. What do you say to, to maybe give hope to that person who's feeling so much just frustration about what isn't getting accomplished in D.C. these days? Well. I share that frustration, and, and I understand it, I get it. In both sides, there are folks who are sort of dug in and just want to fight. I mean, they just want, they want attitude. But I think the broad middle of America 
want solutions, and I think that we as leaders have to articulate not only in terms of tone, but also in substance, um, how we're going to help them achieve those solutions. <laughs> I got a little head start. Despite his careless. lengthy stride and seemingly <laughs> effortless speed, politically, Senator Thune is more likely to be found toward the middle of the pack, somewhere on the right. <laughs> Still in the race to November, he's hoping to chalk up a W to help his party get to the finish line ahead of Democrats in this final sprint. Whoa! You hear that? How you feeling? <laughs> Got another bad start. There are thanks to Senator John Thune still ahead of here on Prime. The man who pretended to be a university student and stayed in a dorm for 10 months. How police believe the imposter got away with it all. The automaker warning some of its customers not to drive certain vehicles. And the baseball team that went from hitting multiple home runs to not being able to get a single hit in back-to-back -back nights. We take a look at the World Series and the battle between Philly and Houston by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, Gerard Piquet with major personal news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the music. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out! It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back, everyone. Game five of the Fall Classic is on tap tonight after the Houston Astros made history in Philadelphia last night. Here is World Series no-hitters by the numbers. There have been just two no-hitters recorded since the World Series began 118 years ago. The feat hasn't happened since 1956 when New York Yankees star Don Larson threw not just a no-hitter but a perfect game to beat the Brooklyn Dodgers at Yankee Stadium. This time it took four Houston Astros pitchers to cement their place in history. History, led by starter Christian Javier, who threw 97 pitches during six innings of a hitless ball. The Astros' aces combined for 14 strikeouts on the way to a 5-0 victory over the Phillies that tied the series at two apiece. There was a third no-hitter in playoff 
baseball history, also in Philadelphia, where Roy Holiday went untouched in game one of the 2010 National League Division Series against the Reds. Current Astros manager Dusty Baker was on the losing end that night. Game five will be historic in the broader sports world, regardless of outcome. It marks just the seventh time a World Series game and an NFL game have taken place on the same day involving the same two metro areas. And while the Phillies Astros series is proving to be a nail biter, the undefeated Philadelphia Eagles are 14 point favorites on the road in Houston to beat the last place Texans. So I guess the big question for diehards is which to watch. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. College athletes have more freedom to use their name, image, and likeness off the playing field. We'll explain how some are trying to use that newfound power to get out the vote. The retailer slashing Thanksgiving prices to pre-inflation numbers will explain. And the man asking people with fancy cars what they do for a living. That's this week's TikTok. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. much happening these days it's hard to keep up things change hour by hour minute by minute the historic weather that's now unfolding the worries on wall street we're bringing you the right now been a nationwide teacher shortage the right now look at the day ahead an alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories world news now and america this morning america's number one early morning news today does feel a little different early mornings on abc news live Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Elizabeth Holmes found guilty on four counts of fraud, facing the possibility of decades in prison. Now, we take you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes. The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Voters head to the polls in five days for the midterm elections. The balance of Congress is on the line, and Republicans and Democrats are focusing on battleground states. Former President Trump hits the campaign trail for a series of rallies in these final days. And President Biden is in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Five days to go, and until the most important elections in our lifetime. U.S. NBA's officials in Russia met with imprisoned WNBA star Brittany Griner. A State Department spokesperson says she's doing about as well as can be expected. Griner currently serving a nine-and-a-half-year prison sentence after she was caught with less than a gram of cannabis oil at a Russian airport. Last week, a Russian court rejected her appeal. The Biden administration says Russia has yet to respond to proposals currently on the table to free Griner. 
Shock and outrage after a man whose students say they thought was a fellow classmate turned out to be living on campus illegally as a fake student. William Curry allegedly presented himself as a Stanford student, seen here on his various social media profiles, including Instagram and a dating app. He had a whole that Curry was an imposter, posing as a student, even living in several dorms on Stanford's campus for nearly a year. Curry ultimately caught on campus last week and was served a stay away order Thursday. Stanford telling ABC News that Curry was a repeat offender and had been cited and removed from campus last December, but kept returning. Owners of over 276,000 older vehicles are being told stop driving them immediately. It comes after Takata driver's side airbags exploded. The warning from Stellantis, formerly Fiat Chrysler, saying it involves Dodge Magnum wagons, Dodge Challenger and Charger models, and Chrysler 300 sedans from 2005 to 2010. Stellantis says airbag inflators blew apart in two cases, killing two people. It suspects a third case. The cars were recalled in 2015, but many never got repaired. He brings fatality from exploding to cut airbags to at least 32 globally. A major lawsuit filed against the NBA San Antonio Spurs and their former player Joshua Primo, a former psychologist for the team, alleging that Primo, the team's first draft pick in 2021, who was released last week, repeatedly exposed himself to her over the course of nearly a year. The lawsuit reportedly claims the Spurs ignored Dr. Hillary Cawthon on multiple occasions when she reported Primo's actions. Cawthon spoke out about the lawsuit in a press conference today. The right thing is <clears throat> saying, no, this is not okay. To hold people accountable, to make systemic change, and to protect those that suffer in silence. The right thing is also to say, I'm sorry. I have failed you, and we need to do better. Primo's attorney saying the allegations were a fabrication and that the 19-year-old was being victimized by his former team-appointed sports psychologist. Spurs also said in a statement that they disagreed with many facts in the timeline but would let the legal process play out. With inflation and rising food prices looming over Thanksgiving, one grocery chain is looking to help shoppers out. Aldi offering a Thanksgiving price rewind, as in rewinding prices back to what they were in 2019 for discounts of up to 30% off. Any food item ranging from appetizers, desserts, sides, or beverages with a rewind sticker on it can be purchased at the lower price, taking a little stress off preparing for the holiday. The discounts are available in all these stores now. As college athletes now have more freedom to use their names, images, and likeness off the playing field, one advocacy group is working with athletes across the country, hoping their influential voices on campus and online will help propel more young people to the polls in key swing states. ABC's Avery Harper spoke with some of the athletes looking to get out the vote. College athletes are often known for their leadership on teams and their skill on the court. And now, in the lead-up to critical midterm elections, some are flexing their political prowess to encourage their peers and fans to cast ballots. I made it tell you that you should definitely vote in the midterms and use your voice to bring positivity and change in your community. Like Kaiwan Dukes, a wide receiver at Johnson C. Smith University in North Carolina. Everybody that can vote definitely needs to vote because their voice matters and their opinion matters. Dukes is one of more than 50 college athletes political advocacy group Next Gen America has enlisted in swing states to help get out the vote. I am making sure that my teammates and classmates are ready to get out and vote in November. And we're bringing the heat from the court to the polls. The group says they have drafted these athletes for democracy, harnessing their reach on social media in hopes that these athletic influencers get thousands of young voters registered and out to the polls come November. Join me. Join me. Join me. Join me and get registered to vote today. It's all made possible by a Supreme Court ruling earlier this year that has given college athletes like Diamond Johnson, a junior guard at NC State, the ability to sign deals using their name, image, and likeness. I want to encourage everybody to get out and vote. If you don't want to vote, play with your mom, not me. Does that give you more freedom to be politically engaged? It does. As an athlete, before the name, image, and like likeness, um, our hands was kind of tied on what we can do and what we can't do. And I think 
that rule being passed has passed a lot of opportunities for us to do stuff like this. Professor Elizabeth Maddow, the director of the Center for Youth Political Participation at Rutgers University, says peer outreach is important. Do you think that these sorts of influencer endorsements could uh, play a role in terms of uh, getting young people to support uh, certain candidates over others? If you have a student who hasn't been thinking about, they're just trying to get acclimated to the college campus and get used to their classes and their roommate. But if they see someone, especially someone in a leadership position on their campus talking about an election, that that might at least encourage them to get involved, to pay attention, maybe not support the same candidate, but at least play a role in politics, because that's the signal that's being sent when you have a campus leader saying this matters. Um, that that peer-to-peer -peer mobilization can really make a positive difference. Young voters could make a difference in the nation's biggest battlegrounds where many candidates are running neck and neck. Of course, that's only if they turn out. According to the latest ABC News Washington Post poll, 49% of voters aged 18 to 29 said they are absolutely certain to vote in November's elections. That number falling below all other age groups. The athletes we talk to say they are hoping to mobilize students by speaking to issues their classmates and communities care about. Johnson's top issue, reproductive rights. I think the abortion issues, it's a lot of, you know, talk topics going around about that, and we all have our own opinions on it, but that's my biggest issue for us being um, a woman and young ladies. And Dukes points to gun violence after his mother survived a shooting. But one thing I say that's real personal to me, I say like gun control and like gun reform and stuff like that. That's something real big where I'm from. That's definitely something big on the voting standpoint that I feel like should definitely decrease. And both hope that their outreach will help polling places across the country score more votes. Our thanks to Avery for that. Now to a conversation with our very own Bob Woodruff and comedian Jeff Ross, known as the Roast Master General, ahead of the Bob Woodruff Foundation's 16th annual Stand Up for Heroes event, honoring our nation's impacted veterans and their families. ABC News Live anchor Diane Macedo caught up with them about plans for the night of hope, healing, and laughter. Thank you both for joining us today. Bob, I want to start with you. You started the Bob Woodruff Foundation uh, after you were injured reporting in Iraq in 2006. So what does this annual Stand Up for Heroes event mean for you and for the veterans and the families that are involved in this event? So this is going to be the 16th year of that. We've we've flown in a bunch of veterans who sit in the front rows. We The best comedians and musicians come, come in and volunteer all their time. It's an honor to be here with all of you. And then also just to you know, send this message out there exactly that these are the veterans who served us and gone through and risked their own lives to do it. And Jeff, you, you already told me that you're so excited for this. This is your second year performing at Stand Up For Heroes. What made you want to get involved? Well, I, I'll be honest with you. I do been sh doing shows for active duty military and veterans since the early days of the Iraq uh, uh, adventure. But I wanted to meet Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already doing these types of shows for active duty military with the USO. Why shouldn't I do some for veterans here at home? I roasted some of the uh, severely injured people up on stage and I realized that they had so many reasons to be bitter and yet they had this incredible thick skin. And I was like, as a roaster, this is the ideal audience for me. You guys already mentioned Springsteen and Bob, the lineup is really incredible. You've got John Stewart on there, the list goes on. So run me through some of the special performances for this year. Well, you know, we got the Lumineers. I wanted to be on this show so badly, I had to join the Lumineers. <laughs> <laughs> So we got a, we got a team of uh, the greatest comedians, but you know John Stewart, as you said, he's been back with us almost every single year. Part maybe because he's from New Jersey, like like Bruce. Jeff, I want to give you a little opportunity. You are best known for your celebrity roast. So do you want to give us a little taste of how you would roast our very own Bob Woodruff? Perhaps? Oh my goodness! Well, let's start with why he's dressed like a used car salesman. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is a big interview. Just because you have 17 awards behind you doesn't mean you can give up on your wardrobe. What is that, an R-O-Z-Z top t-shirt? What is that? Okay. <laughs> Bob, this would be a good year for you to come out for a speed roast during the show. Uh, I can see that being the ultimate encore, a little Bob, a little Bob roast at the end of the night. I think it'd be a hit. 
Well, it's like me doing comedy up to be like having my wife sing. She's the worst singer on the planet. So, you know. uh, do you want us to edit that part out of the interview? Bob? No, no, put it in there. <laughs> Well, I, I bet you're a good singer because from the looks behind you, you won American Idol twice. <laughs> you know what? Maybe I, that's why we kept you out of the show for 16 years. <laughs> How does it feel to be able to be back in New York and be back in person surrounded by the comedians and also the audience that you love? I'm taking no chances. Just got my 34th booster shot. I'm coming in. I'm going <laughs> to hug everybody. You'll hear this at the show on Monday with thousands of people in one room laughing at the same time that you can't hear anywhere else in life. It's really special. I think of it as like a vaccine for your brain. It's, it's, it, it, it fortifies you against all the depression and sadness and crazy news in the world. And we're doing it for the veterans, but it also lifts me up. I really feel like comedy, especially roasting is healing. I'm gonna ask for volunteers to come on stage and I'll line them up and I'll speed roast some volunteers. And maybe there's a way to, to use that as a fundraiser. Maybe we just do it for fun, uh, whatever happens. I want it to be a night where everyone leaves there going, oh my gosh, I got to get roasted next year. That was the most fun I've ever had. And Bob, I know your foundation recently received a $15 million donation from Mackenzie Scott. What has that funding allowed you to do? Every year there's been a different target you know a problem that's emerging for those that for the veterans you know early on when we first started this it was all trying to get people to the hospitals who needed surgery you know there was not getting enough attention from from the va to get them access to everything they needed in terms of their instant immediate uh kind of medical care and then it became a little bit fewer vi visible wounds like then we had to have our money going towards helping people deal deal with their post-traumatic stress, uh, depression. And then of course the COVID hit, and then there are all sorts of uh, d new forms of depression because of that and also unemployment. So now there's actually there's actually a, a food insecurity issues that, that face the veterans. So we get the money and then we find the best programs and organizations out there that are doing kind of work to help them to make sure that they, that end, that money ends up in the right place. And Bob, it surprises me to, to hear you talk about food insecurity among veterans, because you think someone who served this country in such a way should never be struggling for food. So what have you seen on that front? And kind of what do you think would surprise viewers to know that our veterans go through? I think the bulk of it is, is one, unemployment. And part of that is because the military families travel, they, they go from base to base, they move a lot. So therefore the second in the family, uh, the, the spouse of those that's in the military, they lose their job because they suddenly have to move. And so then they can't get another one, the next one they go to. And when you don't have enough jobs, you don't have enough money for food and the quality goes down. And then in the military, it's uh, they think it's kind of a stigma. They want to be all very tough and badass by never asking for help on these kinds of problems. It's amazing the work that you're doing. And Jeff, it's, it's amazing how celebrities like you are all coming together to help put together not just this show, but just all the work that the foundation is doing. So thank you both for both your time today and the work that you're doing. Can't wait to see the show. We're really raising money to trim Bob's eyebrows. I'm jealous. <laughs> Full eyebrows. Well, I think I'm going to take the hair from my brows and staple it to your head. So it's <laughs> <laughs> you got me. You got, you got me, brother. I'll see you in a couple of days. <laughs> Our thanks to Diane, Bob, and Jeff Ross for that conversation. The Woodruff Foundation Stand Up for Heroes event takes place next Monday night. We turn now to our weekly segment, TikTok, where we take a closer look at the story behind the sensation. Our next guest has made a name for himself by asking a simple question. What do you do for a living? TikTok sensation Daniel McDonald, known as It's Daniel Mac, is arguably one of the most recognized voices on the app, racking up more than 13 million followers and 280 million likes for his videos, asking complete strangers in luxurious cars about their professions. Let's take a look. The car, what do you do for a living? You know, I'm a professional YouTuber. Professional YouTuber? Professional YouTuber. Okay, man. Excuse me, I love your car. What do you do for a living? Um, I drift cars for a living. You drift cars for a living? Yeah. Daniel, so good to have you here tonight. Your series, Asking People What They Do for a Living, has just become so popular over the last two years. 
How did you come up with this idea? You know, I really just had it start when I uh, started seeing some crazy supercars in Dallas, Texas. Um, this was before I moved to LA. And uh, I just thought to myself, like, how does someone afford a car like this? And I'm just going to go up and ask them. And I filmed it and it blew up, like, in a way that I could have never expected. So. And what kind of car do you drive? Got to ask you. <laughs> Uh, I drive a Tesla, which may anger some car owners, but I do have a Porsche on the way if it Whoa. ever stopped getting delayed. So I'm going to have both, the electric and the, the real car. So, yeah. The popularity of these videos has just taken you to new heights. Back in September, you actually collaborated with President Biden. Tell us about that. Oh, my gosh. It was probably the, the coolest collaboration one could do. Uh, but, yeah, it was up in Detroit. Um, he knew I was coming, kind of, uh, but it wasn't really like planned out in the way that like, uh, you know, everything was set. So I was just gonna be there. And as he was passing by, kind of uh, getting ready to go in his new EV, um, I ran up and popped the question to him. Uh, so he was really friendly. Um, it was a really unique look seeing him drive because normally the president can't like drive in public. Right. And this was in a convention center. So yeah, it was amazing, so cool. And you interview a wide range of people, as you just said, from the luxury cars to young teenagers and adults. What occupation, what answer has been the most surprising? Oh, my gosh. I've, I've seen literally everything. Um, I'll tell you, probably the most common is, like, people that are, like, in tech or lawyers or real estate. Uh, but I've literally seen every answer you could think of. Like, I'll run into, like, karate masters. I'll run into... Uh, some of the more risque answers, really any industry you can think of, I've seen it. Uh, some are more common, but uh, people have some silly answers as well. What was the coolest car? Oh, gosh. So I got the owner of Pagani, Horatio Pagani, um, in a video, and he was driving a Pagani Waira BC, which is very rare. But I actually randomly ran into him up at an event in California, and it happens to just be my favorite car on the road, and it's street legal, which is wild. So the owner of Pagani himself answered me, and his son kind of like answered for him because he doesn't speak English that well. <laughs> so I, it was kind of embarrassing because I'm like, what do you do for a living? And he's like, I made this car. I'm Pagani. Uh, uh, <laughs> so the coolest car with the coolest answer. And, and you were saying before that you also talk to yacht owners. It's not just the luxury cars. Where do you tend to run into these people? Uh, Miami, and I'm actually going in like a week or so, but Miami is like the craziest place to find like mega yachts. So I'll literally like kind of not like break in, I won't say up on the record, but <laughs> find my way into a yacht yard and uh, go up to these like 150 foot, sometimes 200 foot yachts. And I'll just like yell, you know, from the deck, like, hey, what do you do for a living? And often they'll let me come on board if they've seen my videos and do like a crib style yacht tour uh, and I find out more about what they do. Where would you like to see yourself in, in media in the next five years, let's say? Well, I mean, I, th I think the basis of my account is all about really interviewing people. I mean, it's fun stuff. Um, and, you know, I try to make it like comedic and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, I'm really sitting down with people and I, I want to do more long form style um, interviews and really sit down and find out like, how did you get where you're at? Or like, why are you in your position? in a way that I can't capture with like a one minute video. So I'd like to be more in journalism, um, but longer form. So that's kind of taking shape. I'm starting like a longer form podcast and stuff like that. And I think it'll really bridge um, the wall that kind of exists between wealthy people and the stigma that people have that you can't walk up to them. And my goal is to, you know, kind of break down that barrier. All right, very interesting stuff there, Daniel. We thank you so much for joining our series this week. Don't forget about us when Take you get your me. when you get your mega yacht, your super yacht. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for having me. Before we go tonight, our image of the day, the subtle reminder in Doha storefront that the World Cup will begin in just weeks. That's a replica of the trophy that millions, maybe even billions around the world are hoping that their nation is able to bring home. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, news about a possible breast cancer vaccine. Plus, Selena Gomez opens up sharing her personal struggles with mental health. Stay with us.
so much at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. From the giant sequoias to the waterfalls, it's an amazing place. But in Yosemite, criminals go on vacation too. A park ranger found partial human remains. That was a human hand. That opened the possibility of suspects. Henry Lee Lucas. Carrie Stainer. Donald Gibson. Any of them could have done it. We're gonna figure this thing out. Wild Crime, season two, murder in Yosemite. <laughs> Now streaming only on Hulu. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3. What you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Preliminary research publishing in JAMA Oncology suggests that a vaccine could be used to treat or prevent a particularly aggressive form of breast cancer. Early research of how it works against the uh, HER2 protein is showing promising results. The data comes from a phase one study, but phase two and three will determine if it's safe. Our weather team is tracking severe storms across several states. Possible tornadoes, damaging winds, and large hail is expected from Texas to Kansas. This is near record heat is expected up and down the East Coast this weekend. Forensic scientists have uncovered 24 additional unmarked graves in Oklahoma Cemetery, three of them containing child-sized coffins as part of an effort to identify victims of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. Following World War I, white mobs attacked black residents in a neighborhood known as Black Wall Street and burned down more than a thousand homes and businesses during two days of riots, prompted by allegations that a 19-year-old black shoe shiner assaulted a white female elevator operator. Tonight, we're learning new details about that suspect, David DePap, including reports that he had been in this country illegally for years. At the same time, 82-year-old Paul Pelosi has been released from the hospital after undergoing surgery for his injuries. It's an assault that underscores the nation's deep political divisions, just as Americans are set to exercise their power at the ballot box. ABC's Mola Lange is in San Francisco for us tonight. Tonight, there are multiple reports that the man charged in the brutal attack on House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband, Paul, inside their home was in the U.S. for years illegally. U.S. authorities say they have a record of David DePap, a Canadian citizen, entering the country legally in 2008 at the U.S.-Mexico border. What's unclear is if authorities have any other records of DePap entering or leaving the U.S. through either Canada or Mexico since then. Visitors from Canada are generally allowed to stay here in the country for up to six months at a time. DePap now being held without bail, facing state and federal charges in the attack on Paul Pelosi early Friday morning in San Francisco. We certainly view him as a public safety risk to the city of San Francisco, certainly to uh, the speaker as, as time goes forward. According to the federal affidavit, DePap allegedly telling police that he had planned to hold Nancy hostage, saying if she lied, he was going to break her kneecaps. Paul Pelosi calling 911. DePap striking Pelosi in the head with a hammer just after police arrived. According to the San Francisco DA's office, after the attack, DePap allegedly saying, I didn't really want to hurt him, but you know, this was a suicide mission. I'm not going to stand here and do nothing, even if it cost me my life. And naming other targets, including a professor and several prominent state and federal politicians and their relatives. 
And tonight, new questions after sources tell ABC News that Capitol Police only saw the break-in after they noticed the flashing lights from San Francisco Police in the home surveillance video and rewound the footage. Also tonight, we're learning that Paul Pelosi is out of the hospital and back at home, recovering from his injuries. Good to know he is back at home. Our thanks to Mola. We are just days away, of course, from Election Day. There is growing concern about threats directed at election workers. This comes as President Biden warned in his speech last night that the issue of election safety and the idea of preserving democracy is on the ballot. So tonight, ABC's Terry Moran reports with the poll workers who are facing unprecedented challenges while assuring voters their ballots are secure. These are the images haunting the midterms. Armed poll watchers in tactical gear and balaclavas monitoring ballot boxes in Arizona, raising the specter of conflict and violence in the election. In Adams County, Colorado today, election workers received a ballot with a suspicious powdery substance. We identified it uh, through our processes, secured the ballot, and contacted law enforcement. Authorities are now testing that substance. All right, so this is headquarters. Across the country, election workers like Adams County Clerk Josh Ziegelbaum are doing everything in their power to keep the vote safe, secure, and true. He shows us some of the extraordinary new measures he's taken. Um, voters used to be able to enter in through glass double doors, which have now been replaced with solid core wood doors on badge access. These do have garage doors. And um, there's panic buttons? There's panic buttons Each underneath. Clerk. Ziegelbaum, a former Marine and father of five, has been personally targeted by so many threats that on the advice of the sheriff, he alters his commute every day and wears a bulletproof vest. You wearing one now? Yes. Yeah, I wear one pretty much every single day. You come to work with a bulletproof vest? Yes. In state after state, threats and intimidation against election workers have taken a stunning toll. 10 of Nevada's 17 counties have seen their top election official leave. In Pennsylvania, county election directors or assistant directors in more than 50 of the state's 67 counties have left. And in Texas, 30% of all election officials are gone. Yeah. In Adams County, the work continues. And we're following three election workers who are going around and collecting ballots from the drop boxes. And they're being accompanied by a sheriff's deputy. Sign of the times. We just watch each other's back. Watch each I'd... other's back because you're concerned about security. Safety. safety. Yeah, yeah. Personal safety. Oh, yeah. yeah. Exactly. President Biden pleading with Americans in a way no president has had to do in generations. There's no place, no place for voter intimidation or political violence in America, whether it's directed at Democrats or Republicans. No place, period. No place ever. Today, Michigan's Secretary of State says the election there will be protected. Election officials and law enforcement are more prepared than ever before to immediately address any attempt to interfere or disrupt the election's process or intimidate voters. And in Philadelphia, the district attorney with a stark warning. Extremists of any type who are pondering, interfering in any way with a free fair and final election better be warned we have handcuffs we have jail cells and we have philadelphia juries that will be here he is making his response very clear our thanks to terry moran for that a horrifying assault in new york city today a woman was attacked and raped while a jog along the hudson river just before dawn the attacker took off her clothes credit card and phones but was taken into custody within hours tonight investigators believe the suspect may be linked to two other rapes abc stephanie ramos has the latest Tonight, a suspected serial attacker is under arrest in New York City. Police say 29-year-old Carl Fanner, who is homeless, attacked a 43-year-old woman running in a park along New York's West Side Highway around 5.30 this morning, grabbing her from behind, choking, then assaulting her. Police say he stole her wallet and headphones. She was found by another jogger who called 911. She needed help. She had clearly been traumatized in some way and assaulted. She was just kind of repeating over and over again, I need help. Fanner arrested hours later, allegedly after using the victim's credit card at a target. Authorities charging him with two other attacks, one in the same park back in March and another on the east side. 
Our thanks to Stephanie. NBA superstar Kyrie Irving remains under fire after posting a link to an anti-Semitic film on social media. Irving and his team last night issued a joint statement and donated a million dollars to the Anti-Defamation League. But after Irving failed to unequivocally apologize late tonight, the Nets have now suspended him. Here's ABC's Trevor Roll. Tonight in battle, basketball star Kyrie Irving defending himself amid criticism of his sharing an anti-Semitic documentary. During today's practice, Irving saying he claims responsibility, but stopping short of offering a public apology. I didn't mean to cause any harm. I'm not the one that made the documentary. For the record, do you have any anti-Semitic beliefs? I cannot be anti-Semitic if I know where I come from. That documentary is rife with anti-Semitic views. Irving retweeted a link to it last week, sparking widespread condemnation, including from Brooklyn Nets owner Joe Tsai. Irving continued to defend his actions, but deleted the tweet. He and the Nets later announcing they'll each donate $500,000 to causes and organizations that work to eradicate hate and intolerance in our communities. Irving has promoted multiple false conspiracies in the past, and League Commissioner Adam Silver says he plans on meeting with Irving next week, adding, I am disappointed that he has not offered an unqualified apology and more specifically denounced the vile and harmful content contained in the film he chose to publicize. Our thanks to Trevor. Overseas and Kim Jong-un continues to flex North Korea's military muscle, firing another round of missiles, this time toward Japan. It's an escalation that the Pentagon is watching very closely. Here's ABC's Martha Raddatz. Tonight, the U.S. and South Korea warning North Korea that if it ever attacks the U.S. or its allies with a nuclear weapon, it will be the end of the Kim regime. The warning comes as North Korean missile launches are intensifying at unprecedented levels. Nearly 30 launched in less than 48 hours, including overnight an intercontinental ballistic missile aimed towards Japan. The launch prompting the wailing of emergency sirens across northern Japan with urgent warnings for citizens to seek cover. That missile did not reach Japanese airspace, instead falling into the waters west of the islands. The test launch believed to be a failure. But the barrage of short-range missiles, many pointing towards South Korea, is showing no sign of letting up. Kim Jong-un blaming joint U.S.-South Korean military drills dubbed Vigilant Storm for his missile response. Today, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin meeting with his South Korean counterpart. Our commitment to defending the ROK is ironclad. This also comes as U.S. officials say the North is preparing a nuclear test, something they have not done in five years. Our thanks to Martha. Selena Gomez opens up in a new documentary where she shares her struggles with mental health over the years. ABC's Juju Chang has the first look. Selena Gomez, pop star, actress, philanthropist, who, at the height of her fame, publicly hit the lowest of lows. Selena Gomez was diagnosed with lupus, depression, and anxiety. She had a mental breakdown. No one cares about what you're doing. It's about who I am. I am grateful to be alive. In a new documentary shot over six turbulent years, Selena sharing an unfiltered look into her inner turmoil. In the Apple TV Plus film, Selena Gomez, My Mind and Me. When I first got out, I didn't know how I'd cope with my diagnosis. What if it happened again? What if the next time I didn't come back? She's the first to admit, you know, she's broken. What do you think motivated her to reveal all of this? I still think she feels discomfort about the level of vulnerability that she's given and, and exposing all these parts of her. But that is transcended by her, I think, deep desire to try to make a difference in someone else's life. How do I learn how to breathe my own breath again? The director explaining how filming stopped after Selena suffered a nervous breakdown and was admitted to a mental hospital. Take us to what brought you back to filming. After she came out of the facility, I suddenly realized, wait a second, there's a really fascinating story because she is just out and in recovery herself. And the fact that she's still very much the patient. I needed to keep learning about it. I needed to take it day by day. I spoke to Selena earlier this year, a rare celebrity willing to be open about her mental health struggles. 
It was really freeing to have the information. It made me really happy because I, I started to have a relationship with myself. In this GMA exclusive clip, Selena dealing with severe anxiety amplified by her lupus. I hadn't been on stage in over two years and I still didn't know if I was ready. But what good is having a song if I was too scared to sing it? The stress and fear all bubbling up just before the American Music Awards. I needed to lose you to love me, to love, love you. We're looking forward to seeing that. Our thanks to Juju. Now to David of American Heritage Month. We're looking at indigenous creators in Hollywood and pop culture and the growing perspective of Native American people both on screen and behind the scenes. ABC's Deborah Roberts has more. We could be in California as soon as two months. If you've watched much television lately, you've probably noticed new faces and storylines. From this summer's Prey, featuring a majority indigenous cast and crew, to Reservation Dogs, a humorous take on reservation life. You're good thieves, best in town. Oh, thank you. It is a small town. The critically acclaimed show just renewed for a third season and opening doors to indigenous representation. We're giving children a chance to see themselves on screen. I can see it myself at being at this age that it's changing my perspectives and I can just only imagine what it's like for the younger generation to see that. Devry Jacobs, starring as Alora, is one of its breakout stars. Being a part of a show like Reservation Dogs where it's by indigenous people and it's for indigenous people and it's so fueled with a love for our communities and there's no explaining or spoon feeding to non-native audiences. Now gracing magazine covers, she's even been named one of Time Magazine's 100 Next Most Influential Artists. <laughs> even writing an episode of Reservation Dogs. Cheese. Did you want to say the blessing? Drawing on her childhood in the Ganawege Mohawk oh, territory. You have said that you've almost got to find humor in the pain of the life that so many of these people live. Why is humor important in this story? I feel like humor is the glue that's kept our communities together. And if you think about it, like indigenous folk have already been through genocide of our communities. And, and what's left for us is to celebrate ourselves and to lean on our community. and. When there's nothing left to do, you kind of have to laugh it off. We ask you to bless this food and the people that cooked it. Our friend Delora here, as her grandma transcends into that place in the great beyond in a galaxy far, far away. <clears throat> It's major progress since 2019, when Native Americans barely accounted for 1% of acting or staff writing jobs in Hollywood. We've been doing this for thousands of years. We're storytellers, and it's finally just happening that Hollywood's catching on to it and seeing the vast, rich stories that we do have. Sometimes you have to laugh to keep from crying, as she said. Our thanks to Deb. And still to come, chaos in Pakistan as police try to figure out who shot the country's ousted prime minister. With a dozen best-selling cookbooks and several TV series, she's a major name on the cooking scene. Nigella Lawson joins us to talk about her new book and how it goes beyond the recipes. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? 
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. The streets of an eastern Pakistan city were chaotic after ousted Prime Minister Imran Khan was shot in the shin when his anti-government protest convoy came under attack. Khan, ousted as Prime Minister in a parliamentary confidence vote in April, was standing and waving to thousands of cheering supporters from the roof of a container truck when shots rang out. Police have yet to comment on the attack, which drew condemnation from the White House. An official welcome ceremony was held for Pope Francis in Bahrain. This is only the second visit by a pope to the Arabian Peninsula after his 2019 visit to the United Arab Emirates when he became the first pontiff to visit and say a mass in the peninsula. Bahrain is about 70% Muslim and allows its small community of about 160,000 Catholics made up mostly of foreign workers to practice their faith publicly in two churches. Hundreds of residents are being urged to evacuate from major regional towns as slow-moving floodwaters push downstream and Australia's fourth major flood crisis this year rolls into a second month. Emergency services warn rivers will keep rising for days as water seeps into already swollen floodwaters. With 12 best-selling cookbooks, a TV series, and countless television appearances, our next guest has not only made a name for herself, but set a place for herself in kitchens and dinner tables across the globe. Nigella Lawson is back with her new book, Cook, Eat, Repeat, Ingredients, Recipes, and Stories, with a unique combination of recipes and narrative essays, taking a closer look at some of her favorite recipes. Thank you so much for being oh, here. God, thank you, Lindsay. It's such a joy in, in this book you not only talk about your favorite recipes but memories as well and i want to quote um something that you wrote here you say cooking is not something you do and then it's finished with it's a thread woven through our lives encompassing memory desire and sustenance both physical and emotional what inspired you to open up about cooking in this way i think really it's been on my mind always i'm i've always been interested in the emotional resonance mm. of food and the, the what it says about ourselves you know both personally the food we like you know and it also is about uh our families our cultures so much and i think that what 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 i found as well is that even though despite the title it was a pre-pandemic project um I wrote it in 2020 uh, in lockdown and I think that it, all those factors of how food nourishes not just in terms of in, in terms of keeping you alive physically but the other things the structure it gives you the 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 sense of you know the world being beautiful as well when things are frightening and difficult and i felt very much during um during the lockdown a lot of people who had never really cooked that much suddenly right. had, to had to cook and for you know all the time there are so many demands on us there's so much noise and uh, going on in the world static in our own lives often so that these moments of just being absorbed in something which is so belonged to the realm of the senses is something enormously positive. You're so right, and something that we often don't think about. Yeah. I'm curious, that 20 years ago you wrote your first cookbook. You've had mm. about a dozen since then and countless TV appearances. Mm. When did you realize, I really have a talent for this? Do you know, it's so weird is that I, I never thought I, it still feels like a slightly oh, improbable thing. <laughs> no, because I was a journalist and so not a food journalist mm. at that. And I got interested and I thought I'd do that, but I didn't think it would become, uh, you know, a career. 
But it's more than a career, it's my life. Like that, you know, I always say to people, if you needed to be, have the qualifications of a top chef in order to cook, human beings would have fallen out of the evolutionary loop <laughs> a long time ago. So I'm here to remind of the pleasures of, of home food and, and to say that you can make things which have huge complexity of flavor while being actually simple to make. And you're going on a live tour with this book. Tell us more about that. I'm doing, it's much more of a, a sort of a conversation. Mm, okay. And so I'm going around the country and I'll be interviewed on stage, but what, and this is no disrespect to interviewers, but what is really fascinating and I rather love as well, is that I would say probably over half, but certainly half of it is questions from the audience. Mm. And what I love about that is that you can't, you never know what you're going to be asked. You don't know. And it, every event has its own personality and its own character. And it is to do with the place you're in, but it's also to do with who's there in that particular evening. And it feels like a very... Um, tight connection and with, with people. Because when you talk about food, you're always talking about so many other things in life. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I love it. You have a chapter called Death to the Guilty Pleasure. Yes. I'm certainly not going to ask you, because you were saying that everybody says, what's your guilty pleasure? But what would you say uh, that you would like readers to take away from that chapter in particular? Oh, I, well, I suppose it's various things. I think that there are two main things. One is that... Those of us who've got food to eat are very lucky, oh. and those of us who can enjoy great food, we sh we should be feeling so you know gratitude and not not you know start persecuting ourselves. I think often it's snobbishness. People have say guilty pleasure because they're frightened someone will look down on them for liking something that is not meant to be you know smart or chic, and I I don't like that at all. Everything is good. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm getting hungry as I knew I would. Now you say that everybody can cook. I'm kind of one of those people. I can make a mean French toast. I can do yeah. that for breakfast. But beyond that, are there certain recipes in here that you would point someone like me to who you'd say, look, this is so easy, even you could cook it? <laughs> look, I don't know. I mean, I've, I would find it hard to point out a recipe that wasn't that easy because I don't have any particular skills, certainly don't have dexterity. So I think often when people say they can't cook, often it's just a bit of a lack of interest because mm. you do have to sure. focus on what you're doing. But, but you can cook. Everyone can cook. But I, don't, I think that you don't have to think of it as something you ought to do. I think that's the wrong way to look at it too. You know, enjoying food for me is good enough. Enjoying food, I, I don't mind if I if I, I can buy, I can make bread, but I can also buy a loaf of bread and buy some cheese, buy some good butter, and then sit there and think this is one of the best meals, you know, humanity can provide. So it's all about just being in that moment and being grateful for it and loving it. I, I you know, that's all. Nigella Lawson, we thank you so <laughs> thank much you. for your time. We want to let our viewers know that Cook, Eat, Repeat is now available wherever books are sold. And still to come, how a children's hospital is going that extra mile to give moms a much needed emotional boost. views in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having fun. That rocks.
He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. Finally tonight, our local lowdown. A new service at a hospital for children in Indianapolis is actually aimed at helping moms feel their best. A reporter, Caitlin Kendall, at our partner station, WRTV, brings us to the beauty bar. Okay, do you feel relaxed? There's more to it. Much more than a hair wash. It's conversations. My kind of running joke is I graduated with my psychology degree. But these conversations. So when was your baby born? Her name's Olivia. Giving back that little bit of her. Between two moms. <laughs> but it's just taking care of people. Oh, get it, girl. You're amazing, friends. <laughs> Aren't happening in your traditional hair salon. You're the best. So why here? They're happening at Riley Hospital for Children. The most impactful thing in my life happened here. Four years ago, Sarah Poli delivered baby Amelia at 27 weeks. So a little over three months early. 127 days spent in the NICU at both Community North and Riley. It was horrible. Just one pound, 11 ounces, baby Amelia had to fight. Terrifying. I personally like to describe our time there as a black hole where you are waking up and just moving through the motions and you see no end in sight. That experience? See her just in a whirlwind right now. Yeah. Shared by Courtney. And not holding is tough. You know, she needs support. So. Yes. Carried a baby, delivered a baby, and now watching your baby go through something that you don't want to. Even if it's just, you know, Courtney. Mm -hmm. That makes a difference for her, then great. She's giving back to moms who are in the same position she was in. The power of human touch is unreal. And so to have that moment, that one-on-one -on -one time with someone. An idea that came about more than a year ago. I feel like we're given gifts and a purpose. And this might be, you know, just one little thing that I can do for other people. A wash and a blow dry. To make moms going through the unthinkable feel just a little more like themselves. It's like a straight. Yeah, a little more special. Okay. I've got helps. this. My other word of advice to you. Use the wheelchair as long as you can. Good. Take sure. your time. Good. Thank you. Yep. A little bit of empathy goes such a long way. That's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change.